for attending tonight's school committee meeting. Could you please join me in saluting the flag? <clears throat> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, I'm substituting for the mayor who is traveling outside of the country. Um, the first item on our agenda is the hearing of visitors. Do we have any? Do we have anyone that wants to say a few words for a hearing of visitors? No. Okay. Moving on to the consent agenda. The consent agenda is the routine business of the school committee. This is the opportunity for. Uh, any one of the members to remove a particular item to discuss it in a little more detail. Otherwise, uh, some of the routine matters simply get um, voted on as a block. Um, is there any member that would like to pull any item out? No? Okay. Um, we have some donations, so I'd like to pull out um, uh, enclosures, I think it's three, four, and five. Let's see. Enclosures three, four, and five, yes, um, for, for further discussion. Uh, oh, did I miss two? Did I miss? All right, sorry. Two, three, four, and five. Okay, great. Um, so, can we get a motion to uh, approve everything but for items two, three, four, and five? So moved. Second. Okay, all in favor? All right, okay. All right. Um, the school committee always likes to recognize the generosity of some of uh, the community. And um, item number two is a <coughs> scholarship. I'll briefly read the. Um, Background. Mr. and Mrs. Joseph Miglin re resided in Brockton for 30 years before moving to Avon. Joseph was the owner of WIAZL, the area's most powerful shortwave radio station. Joseph learned everything about running the radio station through experience. Julia um, worked her way up through the ranks at Footjoy and also um, became an expert in the company with no formal education. Um, Mr. and Mrs. Miglin were very generous with charitable donations over the years. In 2012, Julia Miglin created the Joseph and Julia Charitable Scholarship Trust to help young people get the education necessary to enable success in the workforce. Um, there's a scholarship available to Brockton residents who graduated from Avon or Brockton high schools. And there, this is a very generous scholarship. Um, it's three scholarships at $4,000. So that's a very nice scholarship. So. Um, um, I just want to express, obviously, our gratitude. Um, I guess we can vote on this individually. Um, so, uh, any further uh, comment on this? No? Can we have a motion to approve? Second. Okay, all in favor? Okay, thank you. Make a comment about that? Certainly. When you look at scholarships like this that obviously directly uh, impact our children in a very positive way, our students, this is uh, something we'd like to do outreach when we talk about our development office. We want that outreach to our alumni or people that are friends of the Brockton Public Schools because these gifts just keep on giving for these students for many years. And we know when we have some students, uh, first-time college students and their family, they're looking for whatever they can get for financial aid to make uh, it a little bit easier for both themselves and the family. So we encourage people out there. Um, if you would like to remember us in any special way, whether you're an, an alumni or a friend of the Brockton Public Schools, uh, please understand how important it is for our district and our students. Thank you. Um, enclosure number three is another scholarship. Um, in memory of their father, the children of Charles G. Moore would like to establish a scholarship for Brockton High School students who are pursuing a career in the field of criminal justice or a related field. Charles G. Moore and his wife Paula both attended Brockton High School. Mr. Moore would go on to enter the military and later received a GED. Mr. Moore served in the Army Special Forces as a Green Beret and received a Purple Heart and many other awards for his service in Vietnam. 
After an honorable discharge from the Army, he began his own private investigation company and was president and principal investigator for over 40 years. Mr. Moore uh, died in September of 2014 from a brain aneurysm called, caused by a head wound he sustained at the age of 19 while serving in the Army. Um, they have created the Charles G. Memorial um, Charles G. Moore Memorial Scholarship in the amount of $500. Um, so we would certainly like to express our appreciation to the Moore family. Um, any further discussion? Can I hear a motion to approve the Moore uh, Memorial Scholarship, Charles G. Moore Memorial Scholarship? Okay. All in favor? Great. Thank you. Okay. Um, the last scholarship Can you do it? Yeah, you do it. The last scholarship, of course, is our good friend Mike Healy, who was our school committee representative from Ward 6. Uh, Mike was bigger than life. Uh, he was involved in everything that I can remember from coming on as the director of community schools. He was there as a parent. He would show up in his work garb. He would be involved in programs we did for kids, Monte Carlo nights we had to raise money. Um, you know, Mike has just always been, when I talk about those supporters of the Brockton Public Schools, he is one of those uh, supporters extraordinaire. And we are so pleased. We've, we've worked with uh, Jackie and the two daughters, uh, Alana and Catherine. Uh, Catherine's a student now at Brockton High School. Alana is a college student at Hassan University. And I know that Jackie is so pleased to be able to give back, you know, just as we spoke about, you know, to our students in the Brockton Public Schools. And I think we all feel like Mr. Minicello feels. Um, it was my first year as superintendent. Uh, it was uh, very unexpectedly, uh, again, a father of, of young daughters. Um, you know, we're pleased that we're able to really remember Mike in, in this very meaningful way. I think, I think for all of us, certainly, the school committee. Um, I'd just like to say that, you know, all of us who knew Mike knew, like you said, he had a very big personality and um, he loved kids, he loved the school system, he loved the city of Brockton, despite his only flaw, thinking that Brighton had something over Brockton once in a blue moon, but um, he loved Brockton, his adopted city, and um, we all miss him very much. And um, uh, Mr. Jordan came on and um, did a great job. Um, taking Mike's place and uh, we certainly appreciate you stepping up to the plate um, but we still miss our friend Mike so um, anyone else okay all in favor thank you okay um, another nice gesture is um, a donation to the Hancock School acceptance of donation of laptops for the Hancock School um, Ms. Tara Blake, School Adjustment Counselor at the Hancock, was contacted by a member of the Masonic Lodge Angel Fund who wanted to donate 10 refurbished laptops to the school to be used at the school's discretion. The Angel Fund regularly donates to different organizations and schools. These laptops will be used to supplement and replace some of our outdated laptops for student use. So that's certainly very much appreciated and uh, we again want to express our gratitude for the generous donation. Um, Anyone further? Motion to approve? All in favor? Great. Okay. And you forgot to mention. What did I forget? That Tara Shea Blake was oh. my fourth grade student. <laughs> so the adjustment <laughs> counselor. <laughs> so I'm very proud of her. Yes, you should be proud of her. I mean, it does, it does Every show... Every time I see uh, her, she looks 10 years old. Yes, it, you know, it does Maybe. show that we're all getting a bit older, but yes, that's a, that's a very proud fact. It is. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, okay, well, thank you all for those very nice uh, and generous donations. We appreciate them very much. Okay. All right, communications, report of the superintendent of schools. Um, First item, I think, is our student representative, Gavin Rocha. Gavin Rocha, and I want.
want to make a comment before he talks that I had the honor of meeting with in my, they're actually not listening tours, they're listening luncheons. So I actually had the junior class a couple of weeks ago. They were fabulous. Um, their insight, again, continues to amaze me as far as what's important to them. Uh, we take minutes of these meetings. I follow up with Principal Wolder. We have some discussions about <coughs> some of the things that the students are looking to. Uh, it won't surprise any of us. We talk about facilities. We talk about you know, curriculum. We talk about access to programs. Many of the things that you've worked on, uh, certainly, uh, during your tenure on the school committee. So, Gavin, it was a great class. They were terrific. So, the, so what's going on at the school? Uh, first off, I would like to thank the mayor and the school committee members for attending the Adams Scholarship and NHS celebrations. So thank you guys. Um, the Roundup page is running every Thursday in the Enterprise. And this year, most pages are completely filled with student articles and artwork created by students themselves. DECA and the junior and senior class executive committees gave 48 holiday food baskets to BHS families who needed support during the holidays. The Drama Club will present Neil Simpson's Fools in the Little Theater on Friday and Saturday at 7.30 and Sunday at 2 and 6. The holiday concert is scheduled for December 15th and 16th at 7 p.m. in the auditorium. It will feature the choruses and the bands. And lastly, the tryouts for the winter sports have begun this week. Okay. Well, Gavin has to uh, get some rest. Today was his first swim practice, and uh, are you still are you in shape still, or what's the deal here? Yeah, I'm in shape. <laughs> I bet you are in better shape than all of us. So, well, I hope you have a successful season in the swim Thank team. You. So. Thank you. Okay, uh, to continue on, um, as we have been doing during school committee meetings, uh, I know it's been the highlight. I have people out there that I see in the community that talk to me about the presentations about the schools. Uh, tonight will be no different. I want to invite uh, Principal Val Brower up to talk to us about the Brookfield <coughs> Elementary School. I know that she left each of us a treat when we, uh, when we came in this evening. I'm, I'm sure she'll share. And Val, you have a PowerPoint, correct? I do. Okay. And I did just a, a plug for Gowls. Uh, Richie Gowell made those specially for this event. They're smiley faces to go with what I'm going to be talking about. Okay, good evening. Hello to everyone. My name is Valerie Brower. I'm the principal of the Brookfield School. This is my fourth year as the principal of the Brookfield School. Uh, and thinking about what I wanted to talk about tonight, I wanted to highlight things that I felt were unique to the Brookfield School. There are so many things that we're all doing in the schools that are wonderful, but there are some things I think that we're doing at the Brookfield that are unique to us. So in starting, this is the face of the Brookfield. This isn't what the Brookfield looked like five years ago, ten years ago, but it's what the Brookfield looks like now. We're a diverse school, um, not the neighborhood school we used to be. Sorry. <laughs> we, have a right, we have a right around 700 kids, little over, a little under. We're a kindergarten through grade five school. We have a life skills class, three city resource rooms, seven structured English immersion Cape Verdean classrooms, and 20 gen ed classrooms. If you take a minute and look at the then and now, and this, I only went back as far as 2011, which is the year that I, went, I came to the school and the year that things really changed at the school. In 2011, uh, there were many changes at the Brookfield School, and the one that I am most pleased about and my most favorite is the introduction of the Cape Verdean classrooms. We have around 200 Cape Verdean children in our school now. But as you might imagine, that drastically changed the look of the Brookfield School. And any time you change something so dra drastically, there are struggles. So, 
we struggled a little bit with who are we? Who are we now? What do we stand for? What is important to us? These were questions I was thinking about. I knew we were a great school, but I knew things had changed. I came in 2011, so when I came, nothing was different to me, but to all of the staff that was there before me, things were a lot different. So we started to ask ourselves these, quest these, uh, ourselves these questions, and at staff meetings, and we started to talk about who we are, what do we stand for, and some things that came up, we came up with these seven things that we knew to be true. We were inclusive, accepting, tolerant, open-minded, understanding, caring, and respectful. Those were the resounding things that we knew we wanted to be and the things that we wanted to define the Brookfield School. In looking at our school improvement plan, we have, we're doing an excellent job as far as academics, as are all the other schools. Math talks, higher order thinking schools, skills, accountable talk, interactive math journals, close reading, empowering writing, peer observations, growth mindset, vertical data meetings. We are doing an excellent job with all of these things. I'm very proud of our accomplishments in all of these areas. But then we started to talk about things that weren't just based in the educational realm, but were inclusive of the whole child. And we started to talk about things like breakfast in the classroom. We were the first school to introduce breakfast in the classroom and take it on. We were the pilot school. And I could go on about that for a long time. I ended up being a spokesman for the state and going to several conferences and talking on what a success it was. We went from serving about 34% of the children in the school breakfast each day to now over well over 90% of the children eat breakfast daily. And it has been an absolute success. There is not one um, negative. The children love it. We don't have any um, complaints of hunger anymore. It, it's been a wonderful addition to our school. We also have the dental program at our school. We have the box program at our school, which is a, a before school activity, physical activity program, and we've introduced PlayWorks this year. So those are some of the things that we started to look at that really are looking at more than just the educational piece of the child. In, in promoting the social and emotional learning, we looked at three areas. They, they, they need to be knowledgeable, responsible, and caring. For children to become knowledgeable, they must be ready and motivated to learn and capable of integrating new information. To be responsible, they must be able to understand risks and opportunities and be motivated to choose actions and behaviors that serve not only their own interests but those of others. And that was a big deal for us, to look beyond ourselves and have them look beyond themselves. And for children to become caring, they must be able to see beyond themselves and appreciate the concerns of others. They must believe that to care is to be a part of a community that is welcoming, nurturing, nurturing and concerned about them. Again, the responsible piece was something we looked very closely at. These were some things that, again, the teachers working in groups on their own came up with, things that were important to us that we wanted to somehow bring into our school. Fostering a positive school climate is an important aspect of school improvement efforts. It encourages collaboration among faculty and staff and motivates students to get engaged. Good character education is simply good education. It helps solve behavioral problems and improve academic achievement. And then we looked at ways to improve our school climate. Some effective ways to improve the school climate, creating a caring community, providing students with opportunities for moral action, fostering self-motivation, engaging staff as a learning community, and engaging families and the community members as partners. We were doing a really good job at a lot of these things, but I still felt that there was more. There was something missing. There was something that we needed to do that we weren't doing. What we wanted was that when you walked into the school, that you walked into a calm, orderly atmosphere that hums with an exciting, vibrant sense of purposefulness. A positive school, that's a positive school culture, the kind that improves educational outcomes. With all of that behind us and knowing that we were on the right road to, to working on our climate and our culture, again, I said I still felt something was missing. So last winter I was walking through a home show in Boston and between the hammers and nails and ladders and windows and all of the things I was not interested in, I saw one bright 
booth that was colorful and had two women standing in it. And of course, I walked over there, and it was a choose to be nice booth. And I thought, what is a choose to be nice booth doing in the middle of this home show? Well, what I found out was. Choose to be nice was a campaign. I met a woman <coughs> named Dina who started the Choose to be nice campaign. It's it, very simple. She was driving home one day, listening on the radio to the marathon bombings happening. And she knew at that time, she had been thinking for a long time, that she wanted to do something to make a change. And at that minute, she says, it came to her. She just wanted people to be nice to each other. And she felt like that was something that she could take on and somehow promote. So I talked to her for a long time that day, and ultimately I walked away with her phone number and business card and invited her to my school. Her, the mission is simple. The mission of Choose to be Nice is very simple. We want to inspire, promote, and encourage kindness whenever and wherever possible. For an elementary principal, for me, looking at that, a four-year-old can embrace that. A fifth grader can embrace that. Everyone can embrace that. So I thought, it, I thought this really had something that, that would work for us. Dina came to our school. She met with my leadership team and my PTO. They were extremely impressed with the simplicity of the message, yet the powerfulness of the message, and decided that they absolutely wanted to invest in it with me. So from there, we ordered um, the bracelets that you have in front of you. We ordered banners and some other things that would get us going. The next thing we did was introduce it to the teachers. We talked about what does it look like to be nice. Nice is easy. The teachers got together in their grade levels and they came up with what does it look like to be nice in first grade? What does it look like when a second grader is nice? What does it look like when a fifth grader is nice? They had a lot of discussion with their classrooms. They embraced it fully, brought it back, agreed with the simplicity, brought it back to their rooms, brought it to the kids. The next step was the counselors and I went to the classrooms and started to engage the kids in conversation and have them come up with what does it look like when you choose to be nice to someone. Many of them started to come up with something that I know we've all heard, which is you're in the Dunkin' Donuts line and you get up there and it's your turn to pay for your coffee and the person behind you has already paid for your coffee. How does that make you feel? And those were the kinds of things that the kids could relate to and it really started the conversation. And when that conversation started, we knew we were on to something. Oh, I know when I went with my mom, you know, we got up there and the woman said, you're all set, the, the man in front of you paid for your coffee. And we went into how does that make you feel? What does it make you want to do? And that was the big change. It makes you want to go do something nice for someone else. So after going to every classroom and really getting this buzz going and getting the kids on board, we started to do grade level assemblies where each grade level was called down. We went over all of the things that they were, they were starting to talk about as far as choosing to be nice. And at that time, you have it in front of you, they all made the choose to be nice promise. Well, you have it in front of you. So the, the children each made the promise. They signed the banner, which hangs proudly in our front hall right now. But what came from those grade level meetings and those grade level um, assemblies was that they wanted to go beyond the school and they were ready to do it immediately. Parent conferences were coming up. They said, if we're taking the pro making the promise to choose to be nice, we want our parents to make the promise to choose to be nice. So at conferences, we had children at the table. We purchased another banner just for parents and visitors to come and take the promise. And the parents did that during conferences. It was very successful. The buzz was there. When you think about what can a little kid do, a little kid can do a lot reach out to a new kid in school, remember that humans come in all different shapes and sizes and beauty is on the inside, making eye contact and smiling go a long way in making someone's day brighter, please and thank you never get old, offer to help in any capacity. Such simple things that anyone can do that can change anyone's day and we see it day after day. These are, this, these are the banners that hang in our front hall and they have the promise I choose to help spread kindness whenever and wherever possible and to the very best of my ability I'll be nice to those with whom I come into contact on a daily basis and if you go to the choose to be nice website the whole idea behind this is simply to get a million people to make the promise to choose to be nice it's as simple as that from that the children really took off they wanted a new mascot they knew that other schools were doing glitter paws that appealed to them so we had a uh, contest, the children voted, they selected the Brookfield Bears, we now have glitter paws, 
the teachers worked first to come up with what kinds of expectations they would have for the earn, earning of the glitter paws. Then the kids came up with things that they would do to earn glitter paws. And this started probably around last Christmas. And what we have going on now is every Friday I have a box that's in the front hallway. The children enter their paws into the paw box and we choose 10 to 12 names each week of kids who, are, who have chosen to be nice in one way or another that week. And that's when they receive a bracelet, one of the bracelets that you have with you. And the only way that you can get one of those bracelets is to be chosen from the paw box. So it's very something very special that the kids look forward to. We also have mascots that travel from room to room. Again, something that the kids really look forward to. And it's really based all on being nice. When, when we started doing these kinds of things in our school, I'm going to give you one example. Teachers started having their classrooms do random acts of kindness for other classrooms. Might be, it might have just been a uh, child writing, I saw your class in the hallway today and they were doing a really nice job and another child would deliver it. So things like that started happening inside of the school. But then what happened was the kids wanted to do something outside of the school. And in talking with the kids, one thing that we came up with that, that if any of you have been to the Brookfield, you know, we struggle with our, um, the, the in and out of the Brookfield school. We have one way to get in, one way to get out, and a lot of people trying to get in and out at the same time. So one thing that we talked about was the fact that we are not always the best neighbors. We're in a great neighborhood, but if you live next door to us or a couple houses down from us and you have a doctor's appointment at 315, you may have a very difficult time getting out of your house to get to your doctor's appointment. Or if you have a doctor's appointment in the morning or something you need to get out to, we're not always the best neighbors. We don't mean to not be good neighbors, but sometimes we take over the neighborhood for those two times of the day. So we thought, what are things that we can do to reach out to the people right around us to let, to let, us, to let them know that we know we're not the best neighbors, but we care about you, we care about the community, and we do the best we can. So one thing that, that they came up with was to take that, the pledge that you have in front of you and a plant. And every classroom had two or three houses on John Drive. We started with John Drive, and they would take turns through the entire spring walking up. The whole class would walk up. They would sing their Brookfield Bears song that my music teacher wrote for us. They would sing the Brookfield Bears song, walk up to the house that they were assigned, and um, simply put the pledge, which was laminated, with a plant on the front doorstep. Sometimes people would be outside, sometimes they wouldn't, and they would leave it there. And it simply says, please take the pledge with us. We have taken the pledge, please take the pledge with us and choose to be nice. The response from that was absolutely wonderful. This is just a picture of one of our children. This is a man who sits on John Drive in the, in the nice weather. He's always outside. So people started to, he's always out there, so it was nice that the kids got to walk up and say hello to him. But often they would walk up and someone would come out or chase them out and say thank you. And, and just that little, uh, the whole idea of that little gesture would then make the person that they gave the plant to do something nice for someone else that day. No matter what kind of a day you've had, the worst day in the world, you've had the worst day in the world, if you walk home and there's a plant on your front doorstep with the Choose to be Nice campaign from children who are asking you to join them, it's going to turn your day around. And that's what we talked about. So we started to be known in the neighborhood for the first time. People had a, had a, a started to have a connection with us. This was an unexpected reward. It was only one. There were many, but this was one that I like to highlight. This was a woman who lived, she, it lives on John Drive, and she um, was home, happened to be home the day that the class, this is Mrs. Collins, one of my, she was a first grade teacher at the time, one of my first grade teachers, class walked up, brought the plant to the, to the front door and dropped it, down, dropped it down. She came out and said, oh, please wait, my son, and my adult son is home, and he's, he's ill, and he wants to come to the door. Great. So he came to the door. Both of them, they were so happy, so excited to, to see the kids. They you know, chatted for a few minutes and the kids walked back to school. You would think end of story, but it's not the end of the story. And that's what this is all about. A couple of days later, Mrs. Matheson is her name, showed up at the school and she had a card for the class and she wanted to go and thank them for taking the time to come out to the neighborhood to talk to her and to talk to her son. She said her son was ill and it made his day. What she didn't realize was it made our day and the children's day probably more than it 
made anyone else's day. So I brought her down to the classroom and um, with tears in their eyes and the teacher's eyes, Mrs. Matheson explained to the kids what it meant to receive that plan. And honestly, from then on, it has just been wildly successful, these kinds of little ra random acts of kindness. So um, our plan this year is to possibly expand to Sully and do some of the other, other neighbors. We had a big choose to be nice um, event at the end of the year and it was almost a thank you to the children. I wanted it to be something fun but I also wanted it to be almost like a coming out party for the Brookfield. We had, unfortunately it rained so it wasn't outside like we had planned and I know that some of you were able to be there but what we did was um, we, had, we invited the city officials. We had talked a lot to the kids about you know, we're bigger than us. Let's invite the people around us, the firemen, the policemen, the mayor, the school committee members, to come join us to, take the pro to make the promise to choose to be nice. And several people did show up. And what we did was it was a fun, fun day for any of you that were there, you know. Um, we had some surprises for the kids. And it, it was really just a beautiful event. Mrs. Matheson was our special guest. And the fire, some of the firemen came, some of the policemen came, some of the neighbors came. And it was... For us, it was just the beginning of a, a very positive spin on what I think was a school that a lot of people don't know about or don't hear about because we're tucked away in, in a corner of the city. We've made it into the newspaper, I think, three times since last Christmas for this, which is nice. A lot of positive publicity for us. And we can say now, we know who we are, we know what we stand for, and we know what is important to us. I have um, one thing I want to just show you and then a sh very short video. Um, from this has also come uh, a newsletter that we send out every month with all of the things that the kids are doing. The, the school adjustment counselors now have groups of children at each grade level running different campaigns. For example, um, success story, the month of November the Brookfield community donated close to $1,000 worth of food to the Mainspring House. The month of January, the Brookfield community donated over $1,000 to pennies for patients. So each month, a group of children from uh, any given grade level are coming up with some, something that they want to target as uh, in the community to raise funds for or reach out to. We have a lot of things happening this coming year. We've got a lot of new ideas, and we just anticipate that this will continue to grow. And uh, like I said, I... Uh, Academically, I think we've been doing a really good job for a long time, and I feel like our climate and culture has, has come to be so positive, and I'm, I'm really just so proud of, uh, to be the principal of the school and t of all the children and all of the faculty and everyone in the community in the school. So if you can um, bear with me, we have a short video. And so what we wanted to do was call together some of the important people in Brockton and have you take the promise as well and sign your own banner. This is a banner with people who are not in the school, but community people that we have got to take the promise with us. <laughs>
Thank you for your time and for allowing me to tell you a little bit about the Brookfield School. come here we'd like them to give you a flavor about their school I think we're feeling that for every one of the schools that we see um, you know like Val I'm very proud when I go into these schools and it's not only about choosing to be nice um, it's certainly all of the different activities the dental the breakfast in the classroom making sure the kids are coming every day prepared you know for their academics but they're supported you know for the whole child um, I, I do have to say, I, I know I said this to you last spring after attending that June 15th uh, kind of rainy day celebration inside. And of course, when they talk about teachers, you know, everybody claps, but you had to hear them give a round of applause for our firefighters and our police. And I said, that's the kind of community that I want to live in when the kids certainly appreciate those that support them. So, again, uh, just, just wonderful. Good. Any questions? Anyone? Questions? Um, Mrs. Brower, um, uh, yeah, you weren't very nice. You ran away. <laughs> so the individuals that you saw at the home show, is, is there still an affiliation or there is there is. some sort of a collaboration going it's, on? Well, it's, it's, it's very simple, that's the thing, and if you go to the website, it's called choosetobenice.com, and it is, uh, it is this one woman, Dina, wonderful woman, who, who has, has now, this, she's made it her life's mission, she doesn't, um, she had a full-time 
you know, job in, in the business world. And um, she's given that up. And she goes and speaks to different groups. And it's quite simply about making the promise to choose to be nice. It's as simple as that. And um, one thing that we did was a uh, fundraiser with the T-shirts. And our goal was to have every child be able to have a T-shirt. We're not there yet, but we're on our way. And with the money that we raised from the T-shirts, the children get the T-shirts at cost. We sell them at cost to the children. But the teachers, who have bought many, many T-shirts and sweatshirts, from the, the um, money that we make from the, the teachers buying the T-shirts and sweatshirts, we, that's the money we take and we put back into the community for things like the plants for the neighbors and... Um, things like that. So we're trying to take all the money and use it again for the same purpose. But um, it's, it's, it's very simple. And we do still have, she still um, is in contact with me all the time. She often will um, reach out to me. She's right now uh, writing a, with, with some other teachers that might even be ready, um, an actual curriculum for, for being nice. So she's asked me um, some questions about things like that and what, you know, what kinds of things kids, kids would like. So uh, she's absolutely somebody I would reach out to any time. And she's just a positive, wonderful woman. And like I said, such a simple concept, but so powerful. It, but it is what you make of it. And the kids have run with it. And the teachers have run with it. And does she... Is she connected with the fundraising? Is it she will. She gets the t. She has the t-shirts. They go through her, but she does not make any money off of them. Oh. So no, oh, the money comes right back to us. Wow. So for her, it is a nonprofit. She is, um, like I said, her mission is to spread the word and to have people make the promise. That's nice. It's. That's just it. It is nice. <laughs> It also ties in with our district strategic plan, and I'm sure your school strategic plan, mm -hmm. when you talk about, again, uh, one of our big pillars, our rocks, is a safe and supportive environment. Absolutely. So very nicely. Anyone else? Andy, are this, I'm stunned. This is right up your alley. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I'm so... Mostly around the breakfast in the classroom mm -hmm. stuff, which um, it's, it's ju it, I mean, you guys really kind of help kickstart that in the district and... and uh, you know, I can't thank you guys enough for that. It's, it's been something that I've championed. But, I, you know, I, what I appreciate about this presentation and what I've seen at the Brookfield really is how deliberate you are about making all of these things, whether it's the Choose to Be Nice campaign or the Breakfast in the Classroom or the Dental Program, like a part of what you do. I think, you know, too often, you know, schools or districts look at these programs and they say, how do we do, so, how do, we do this extra thing? How do we add this on? to the pile of things that we are also already have to do. And, and not often enough are the things that you're talking about here thought of as part of education. <laughs> and part, I mean, the ki our kids especially, mm -hmm. so many of them, there's so much that they deal with outside of school. And to think that those things that happen outside of school don't come into the building and impact teaching and learning is just kind of silly to me. And, and um, you know, the idea that that these things have to be part of what we do mm -hmm. because we can't do all the other important stuff without them. Um, and, and you're one of the best examples of that in the district, Thank in you. my opinion. And, and I'm so pleased to see these things happening. And, and um, you know, I've enjoyed every opportunity I've had to, to visit your school. We'd love to have so. you. Thank you. It's Mr. Robinson. You really hit the nail on the head. It's exactly what you said. It's that we have we realize and we recognize that we need to look at the whole child. And I never look at anything as one more thing. The breakfast is it's what we need. Choose to be nice was what we needed, and it is the culture and the climate of our school now. So I think you're right. And to ignore what's happening outside wouldn't help us. So we do embrace it. The dental health, love it. Um, another wildly successful program at my school. Um, um, they know, ask me to do anything. I'm, I'm willing to pilot or try anything. Yeah, I mean, it's just funny to <laughs> kind of see the whole thing come full circle. You know, you guys brought all these programs into your school to kind of address the needs of the students that mm -hmm. were there, and now they're going back out into the community you know, that's it's kind our, of that's this our like hope. <laughs> you know, the, the circle that now the things that are happening in your school are spreading beyond your own school walls, and uh, you know, it's exactly what you would look mm -hmm. for and you would want in, in, a, in a community. And and you know, your school is a microcosm of our, our larger community. I and think it's so. It's just great to see you having an impact or choosing to have an impact the way that you do. Thank you. We have. I just want to give one. We had in the enterprise on Sunday. If any, I believe it was on Sunday. One of our children. I opened the enterprise and a giant <coughs> picture of her on Thanksgiving Day pouring juice into a homeless man's glass. Um, and 
you know, I have that laminated on my desk, and all of those things are, the, the, every one of them is laminated and hung in my office, and we make a big deal out of things like that. Um, you know, that, uh, things like that just go so far, and to know that these kids are out in the community doing these, these beautiful acts for other people is, is wonderful. So thank you. Yeah. <coughs> Okay, thank you. Thank Very you. Much. Uh, next up is uh, yesterday we had uh, an anticipated visit from the DESE. Uh, the Senior Associate Commissioner Russell Johnson was in the district along with uh, Lisa Zieg, another Associate Commissioner. I was under the weather, the worst day to be under the weather. I want to thank Deputy Superintendent Liz Barry who had prepared the visit, certainly handled it, and I was conference called in for the debriefing. And I want you to hear about, you know, it's one thing to bring them in, and I'm going to ask Deputy Superintendent Barry to come up, along with Dr. Cancel, not only to talk about the visit and some of the things that we're able to put on the table. So when the DESE comes here, they say to us, what about our partnerships and collaborations? Are these working for you? And I like when they say to me, please be honest with us. Oh, yes, I will be very, very honest with you. And we were able to talk about a number of things, looking at uh, the MCAS 2.0 coming in, looking at equity in education and talking about technology and making sure our students are served well, looking at uh, finances and budgeting in ways that we can take a look at, you know, how our monies are being spent. Things were brought up such as, you know, curriculum that we're implementing in a few schools clearly because of budget issues when we want to build capacity in the district. So all of these were very honest, frank conversations that we had yesterday. I've also asked Dr. Cancel, especially with our outgoing members, you know, leaving very soon. You've been such a big part of what's happened with our POC decisions and our decisions going forward. The scores are ac actually, and the levels are actually embargoed until the week of December 7th. So we are planning, and we'll talk tonight about a subcommittee meeting before you leave, to talk about these results, you know, so you can certainly ask questions and see where we think we're at. But one of the things that's coming up before that 15th date, or right around that time, is on the 18th of December, they're looking for districts. Uh, to make some decisions. Now, I shared with you last time, and I've asked Dr. Kinsell to go over with you tonight. Um, we, we have to take park. We were a park district last year. We do not have a choice in being a park district, but there are some choices that we need to make by the 18th of December as a school district. So I've asked him to talk about that, and then Deputy Superintendent Barry will share some of the information from yesterday. We will uh, choose to be nice by being as brief as possible. So, uh, see, do you like the look? Yeah. Thank you. So, we, we tried to uh, put it out for you, the uh, key decisions, and the, the first one really, November 17th, it's pretty late in the school year, but November 17th, the board met, they voted 8 to 3, and that's when they went with the door number 3 option, the next generation MCAS, a sort of not quite PARC, not quite MCAS, MCAS 2.0, and it's going to be administered in the spring of 2017. Now, the board, therefore, as a result of that, the, the uh, board, you know, told the commissioner and the Department of Ed, okay, now let's, let's get to this, and these were the rules that were sort of interesting. If you gave PARC in 2015, you have to give park. You don't have a choice. So we do not have a choice in this. We will give park again in the spring of 2016. If you administered MCAS last year, you have a choice of park or MCAS, but there's a very strong incentive to do park. You're held harmless. If you do MCAS, you're not. That's not our option. And the state also announced that it will commit and we're not quite sure what that means, but it will commit to a statewide computer testing by spring of 2019. So by then, everything should be on computer. Hopefully, the uh, commitment will come with some financial resources, but that is, um, you know, the first of the state decisions. Kathy said, just give us a slide. <laughs> it's like, well, there are a lot of decisions here. So um, more state board decisions. Uh, any district that administered park in 2015 or in 2016, this is new, 
will be held harmless. I think that's a very good idea because they found out when you administer a, an assessment for the first time, it doesn't matter what the assessment is, there will be, you know, sort of growing pains. And so it is a very, very good idea to hold the, the schools and districts harmless. In 2017, and this was very surprising and, and made everyone happy, that's when the entire state goes back to having a single test. So there's some MCAS and some PARC this year, but 2017, everyone's going to be doing this new test, and they will also be held harmless. So that's a big deal. And then um, something else that we just want to keep out there, that's true but not for high school. High school to get your competency determination so you can graduate with a high school diploma, that's still going to be MCAS. They're working. Because that is a high stake, they really need to get that right. There can't be the sort of growing pains that are with the other part of um, you know, either PARC or MCAS 2.0. So they, they wisely pushed that one out. And um, they will announce, they have to make up a new test, obviously, and they will announce what, what comes there. But for the time being, it's still MCAS for high school. And there are still more <laughs> board decisions. Um, the board is going to convene a group, and this group will be educators and you know all sorts of experts who are going to determine the content, length, and scheduling of the statewide tests the policies for students with disabilities and English language learners. This, by the way, was a major sticking point. Um, not only did it take a huge amount of time and effort, but we didn't get to determine what, um, what PARC called accessibility features, what we always called accommodations. The consortium decided what they would be, and that really annoyed Massachusetts because they're things that we are used to for students with disabilities. Our standard is much higher than other states. So there are things that are just reasonable, in my opinion, reasonable assessment practices that, that give students with disability the best opportunity to show what they know and not their disability. Being part of a consortium, that didn't happen, so this was a big sticking point, and um, now Massachusetts educators will decide once again what these policies are as opposed to a multi-state consortium. And they'll also have to come up with these new high school um, competency determinations, so that's going to be big. And uh, they're putting out there a timeline for reinstating history and social science tests. That was one of the original um, pillars of the MCAS as assessment system and it sort of never really made it to prime time. And so they're, they're going back and they're, they're going to say, you know, this time we're going to get history and social science right. And I, I can tell you just from, you know, my point of view, when MCAS emphasized and the accountability system started to emphasize science, guess what happened? A lot more emphasis on science. Prior to that, you could double up math, double up English. What did you cut? Science and, and history. So uh, this is in the future. It's something, um, you know, we'll have to see. It will have an impact. As a result of all of those state decisions, we made decisions, and this is just a quick reminder. Back in 2014, uh, I felt like I was a lot younger back then. Back in 2014, there, okay. I would make Delayed a comment, laugh, but I'm choosing but to be nice. Yep. Um, in 2014, <laughs> the state chose a sample of Brockton schools to pilot park. And again, we didn't have a choice in this. It was, you know, here's the sample of schools that everyone in the, in the state was, you know, part of this. Ultimately, um, we decided as a district, as a school committee, you approved it. The decision to administer PARC in 2015 gave us a uh, sort of head start on the rest of the state. We also, I broke this out because it, it the online schools, there are five schools that participate in the online schools. I think it's the right thing for us to do, and I think it is a huge amount of work. And I think that it was a real challenge for the, the students, although you always hear, oh, you know, kids love technology, they're born with the devices in their hands. That may be true, but taking a test on those devices is different from checking social media or playing a game. 
So it, it really was a challenge, and I'm, I'm glad we did it. It showed a lot of the shortcomings that districts have in terms of um, an unrealistic uh, investment in technology. What we think of as a large investment, businesses think of as a tiny, tiny, inadequate investment. It, it's a real challenge, and hopefully now that it's a state issue, we'll get some traction on it. Um, by December 18th, and that's this December 18th, we have to make some decisions. And the big decision is going to be, do we expand or do we contract the number of schools taking the test online? So we don't have a choice in the sense that everyone is taking PARC. But we do theoretically have a choice of, do we take all paper and pencil? Do we take all online? Um, do we take a combination? A school, ha it has to be a whole school decision. It can't be, well, third grade will do it and fourth grade won't. So, uh, you know, the uh, Raymond School will be online, so, so be it. And I'm not saying they were. They were last year. I'm not saying they're going to be. But that's, it's all or nothing. You can have five schools, ten schools, two schools, no schools. But it is an all or nothing. I, I should mention, too, um, that... What did happen was, um, we so that December 18th deadline, Superintendent Smith um, referenced that there is a possibility that we may be getting an extension on that deadline, and we have lots of reason to believe that we will. Tomorrow, we are meeting with all of the principals, and we will be reviewing some preliminary um, results at the district level. The results are still embargoed, so we have to wait for, for the public reveal. Um, we will be reviewing results and then we will also be discussing our own decisions, the decisions that we have to make. Um, and, and that will be one of the areas that we'll focus on tomorrow. Once we're able to discuss these options with principals, we will actually bring some recommendations forward to you um, so that you can make the decisions as school committee. Just go to the next slide. Oh, I'm Thank sorry. you. That's okay. Um, and as Superintendent Smith referenced, we were visited yesterday by Senior Associate Commissioner Russell Johnston and Associate Commissioner Lisa Zeig, and our district liaison, Eve Bassett, um, also played a role in the visit. We were allowed to pick the focus of uh, the visit and the schools that we wanted them to actually go to, and we thought that given where we are with PARC and given the decisions that we are making, as well as our own examination of preliminary results, we really wanted to give them the opportunity to hear from a school that um, had administered the online test and really what they had learned from it. So uh, they attended a teacher focus group at the Ashfield School um, and the focus group really um, it was all grade levels and all contents and the teachers um, spoke very frankly about their experiences with the online assessment. Uh, there were nine teachers in the room and I felt like everyone had something um, to contribute to the conversation. Um, both uh, Senior Associate Commissioner Johnston and Associate Commissioner Zeig were, 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 um, were very engaged in the conversation as well. Um, one of the things that they both expressed was that it was clear that although the school had made uh, appropriate curricular shifts over the years to get ready for the Common Core Standards, there was a, a level of frustration uh, that related to student access to technology and the feeling that kids coming in at sixth grade not having technology at home and having those opportunities in a limited way at school um, didn't really um, meet the needs of students or teachers and the frustration was that part of what uh, they saw in, in the online assessment and the results was related uh, to that lack of exposure among the students. From the Ashfield, we, uh, we attended a, a visit at the Raymond um, where the focus of that visit was on expanded learning time and the work of the school improvement teams at the Raymond School. Some of um, the things that were discussed were actually um, elements of the presentation that Principal McGrath brought forward to you recently at a, at a school committee meeting. Um, the online assessment um, came up again because the Raymond School was an online school as well. So again, um, both uh, 
both um, Mr. Johnson as well as Ms. Saig were again hearing about um, really the complexities of giving an online assessment. Um, the Raymond School was able to speak to um, really the developmental appropriateness of an assessment for kids that young, grade three, grade four, and, and the idea that perhaps um, students taking the test online at such a young age um, may or may not be the right thing to do. So although that wasn't the focus of the visit, we, we again had another conversation about PARC and um, we found um, folks from the state to be uh, very attentive to what we were saying, um, what they were learning from the teachers in the field, and what they intend to bring back to, to other folks at the state level to inform additional decisions. Um, you can see that the state is moving ahead with a very ambitious agenda and we do have that all schools, all online assessment um, vision in 2017 and one of the things that we need to decide is how we continue to get um, schools ready um, and students ready as well as teachers ready um, all the way down to kindergarten um, because one of the things that was expressed at the Ashfield was they, the kids really need to have these skills prior to coming to middle school and is, it's our hope that as we infuse technology into schools we're going to be able to do that so that kids are very adept and very comfortable with using a computer to actually take an online assessment. You know, there's um, one piece that oh, I'm I... I'm sorry. I said 2007, I, 2019. I apologize. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> that was not what I was going to say. <laughs> um, in my role as an accountability person and having worked at, at the state and in another state um, at the state level, it, it's really worth noting the sort of relationship that Brockton has with the state that's been developed over time and the respect that the state has for Brockton. It's not by mistake that people come here. And one of the things that's unusual about Brockton is Brockton is willing to share. There are a lot of people who sort of want to keep the good stuff inside and not let other people know about it. But because Brockton is willing and able to share best practices, to share what it is we do, how we get the results we get, and to be honest, and that's a big thing. We don't, we don't run away and hide from our weaknesses. We're honest about this is how we did, this is where we did well, this is what we need to work on. And so I really think that, you know, you've got, in this case, a senior associate commissioner, Russell Johnson, he carries a lot of weight. Lisa Zeig, when it comes to accountability, she's the one. You know, so they really do take back information mm -hmm. We're, we're constantly through our park fellows, through you know my, my long-standing relationships with the assessment people and the accountability people, with Kathy's efforts, with the deputies. I mean, we really have continued to develop this relationship with the state. I can't tell you how important it is when the commissioner comes here and he visits and he really is impressed by schools and then he's the one who makes decisions. It's not by mistake that we get the grants we get or we win the grants that we win. It's not by mistake that we don't have level four schools. It's because we, unlike many other districts, and I will include charter schools in this, we are willing to share our innovation and our, our good practices. So I think that's, that's one of the important things, you know, about this visit that um, I, I think is a real strength of Brockton's. So as you can see, the ball is moving very quickly, and uh, again, I reiter reiterate what Dr. Cancel said. We want to make sure that we're at the forefront, that we're part of the decision making, and we'll be sharing with you. Hopefully, we'll come up with uh, an evening oh, tonight to do a subcommittee meeting where we can share the results with all of you and get ready for the decisions that we have to make. to be used as a competency determination for graduation. That's a high stakes test at 10th grade mm -hmm. and, and it has large ramifications for students. Have there been discussions or any concerns expressed over the fact that at the lower grades we're moving to a different assessment and then when it really counts 
they're taking a different type of assessment than than they've been taking for years and how long do they expect this to happen I would imagine that one of the benefits of having taken the MCAS test for all these years is then when it really counts for a graduation requirement they're accustomed to the the, the format, they're accustomed to the type of test it is, it's a different right. assessment than PARC. Yep. And so are there concerns that it's going to affect? And, and um, that's, that's part of the, it's a great, it's a great point that you make. Um, there's that gap between 8th and 10th grade. So the 10th the grade students of this year last took MCAS in 8th grade. Mm -hmm. So next year, you know, so they didn't have a chance to take park. They never took park. So right. the idea is, as as they go forward, the, the students who have only had MCAS get to stay with MCAS. As the students have more and more park in their experience, they're going to shift. And I will I'll point this out. The tests are getting closer. So MCAS will have some uh, park questions on it. The regular MCAS will. Park will obviously have the park things, yep. and the new test is going to be. It sounds like we don't know this, but it sounds like it's going to be a, a strongly influenced by park test, probably on the platform using the questions developed by park, and they are of the common core. So they've sort of staggered in the the time frame, knowing that the students, you know, they go from eighth grade, then they don't take a test ninth grade, so they they've kind of built that in. Yeah, I don't see it being an issue for the next few years. Right. But if the state doesn't move to change that 10th grade test to be more aligned with the assessments that they're taking coming through, right. it may it may be a problem. Right, and I think that's they're they're really hustling right now yeah. to get that group together so they can establish that what will be the new competency determination. And as you said, that's that's an actual stake. You know, how you do in your fourth grade, you care, you know, your grandparents care, but it doesn't, aff it, it doesn't affect your graduating from Not anything. Not necessarily indicative right. of what's going to happen in right. tenth grade, right? It's Just a good point. One other question. Um, as far as this decision that we have to make to go all online or not online, or if we want to expand the schools, is, e is going system-wide online even an option for us because we just don't have the technology. No. So I think before we make the decision mm -hmm. as far as how much we expand it, I think we t need to know w how much we can expand it based on our current technology infrastructure. And I think some of the some of the the things that you would want to know to make that decision would be what kind of experiences do the kids currently have with technology, whether we're talking about tablets or iPads or, and if, if those experiences are limited, well that's, that's the decision that we then make because we felt very strongly all along that when the students actually sit down to take that test, mm -hmm. it has to be a content test and it cannot be how well does the student navigate, you know, on the, on the tablet. We may not even have the equipment or the bandwidth right. to be able right. to handle it in the first place, regardless of what their right. experiences mm -hmm. are. You right. know? So if we don't have enough tablets or whatever they're using, then it's a moot point. Right. And we, we have had a lot of discussion already, and we just need to include the principals at this point, but um, it's exactly to that point. Mm -hmm. um, without having the technology in schools and without having done a lot of work on that infrastructure yeah. at this point in time it makes a lot of sense for us not to expand any online locations we still need to focus on getting the technology into right. schools so that the teachers and students become more proficient with it but it won't be because we're testing kids in the spring, right. you know, on that measure. Exactly. Yeah. It's like putting the cat before the horse right. a little bit. Right. Yeah. Good point. Thank you. A couple questions. First being, so they're developing these tools. Have they identified, is there going to be a, so we, we were one kind of an early adopter, right? So we had this opportunity to have like a reasonable level of influence through our park fellows and others. Mm -hmm. Is there any indication that those folks are going to be able to continue to be involved oh, yeah. as the tools develop? I, I assume they, they're going to leverage these folks who've been working on yep. this for, for quite some time. Yep. And yeah, park, park is complicated because it's different. 
It has different uh, levels. It, it's testing different. It's designed different. They're they're different. Um, they're different reports you can run. You can now truly look across grade levels, which you couldn't before. So they're they're just a lot of different parts. And so the investment and the expertise as a result of the investment that the Park Fellows have, the state's going to continue using them. And the state needs to, you know, they have to develop this new assessment. There are now going to be a lot of districts that didn't go and take park who are going to be clamoring for this information. And in some cases, they didn't because they knew they weren't ready. Brockton runs a pretty tight ship. I mean, I, I don't want to toot our own, you know, my horn, but in terms of assessment, <coughs> Brockton's got its act together. Other districts, that's not the case. So when we did this, we knew we could do this. And so now there are going to be a whole bunch of districts coming on who may or may not be able to do that, and the state's going to have to help, and there's there are only a limited number of them, so they rely, they tend to distribute the leadership, and they rely on that expertise in the field. Good. My other question is, we're kind of going to be entering this period now where the way I understand it, we're going to be held harmless essentially through two, 2017 as a district. What does that do to our school's level statuses, our school improvement plans? How, I mean, presumably it's a good thing for us, right? It's, it's kind of this, we take a little bit of a deep breath, but it also gives us this window to potentially leverage to, to make some leaps without having to worry about how it impacts right. testing, mm -hmm. um, you know, to implement programs or, or innovative kind mm -hmm. of educational opportunities that might help us set ourselves up without having to worry about how it might impact a standardized test that could push us to level four or whatever. I'm just wondering if you guys are starting to think about that or talk about that and if you're anticipating how, how it yeah. might help or hurt us to kind of be held harmless. I can answer the accountability side and then Liz can talk the teaching and learning. The, the accountability one is kind of easy. Held harmless on accountability means you can't go down, you can only improve. But it also sounds a lot better than it actually is. You still get results. They're still public. Um, and there's some there are some features that have real impacts on districts that you're not held harmless on. So you are still rank ordered and given a percentile score. You are not held harmless on that. When we earned our way out of the bottom 10%, which made the New Heights Charter last year, basically they, they should not have been allowed to come in. That was real and that is not held harmless. So we will be ranked percentilely Regardless, we will just not have an official, a school status will not change. And so that's, that's on just the accountability side. Yeah, and I would just say we, we hold ourselves accountable through multiple measures all the time. Um, and so not to have um, that accountability status doesn't change what we expect of ourselves, um, the kinds of plans and the kinds of movement we expect to see in school improvement plans, in our district strategic plan. We also have a myriad of um, formative assessments within the district where we are looking at student growth all the time in a formative way. Um, so, so that summative measure, of, of course it matters, um, but it's, it's one of many ways in which we really hold ourselves accountable. Okay, thank you. I think it also lets us focus on what we need to focus yeah. on by being so-called held harmless. Yeah, the that's, that's kind of what I was trying to get at it a lot, you know. I mean, like you said, there are these accountability scores, but I think ultimately the public looks at, well, are you level three or level four or level two or level one? You know, what are they? BPI and they don't know any of that stuff and they don't really care. They just right. tell me what level school you are. I know right. level four is bad and I know level one is really good. Right. And so if kind of that language disappears for a couple of years for us for all intents and purposes. Well, it doesn't disappear though. It yeah, just well, means that you're saying. held, it, you can't go down, but if you were a level three school and you don't go up, you're still, you're still level, level three. three school and it is publicly reported. But, but often, you know, I feel like we're kind of trying to triage to some degree to keep Correct. ourselves from dropping and and now we don't have to necessarily worry about triaging we just worry about getting better yeah and you that's know. what we hope to be able to share with you we want to see those schools that we hope are level two level one we're excited about those opportunities mm -hmm. yeah all right good thank you
have. This vision and plan going forward, I think everybody knows what's going to happen. But did you get the feeling that the state really recognizes the equipment level at the classroom? Because it's nice to put all this stuff on and online and this, that, and the other. And as we said over and over and over, if the youngsters don't have the equipment, we have a problem. And when we last looked at it, if I remember correctly, I think we talked about five years of getting where we'd like to be, which throws this into another ball game. Did they actually realize that? Did they have any plans or any suggestions that they may have to those above to have those folks join in on if this is what it has to be, dollars have to come out for that mm -hmm. equipment because there's no other way for it to work. Yeah, I, I definitely got the impression that they were listening very carefully. Um, and what was interesting about the Ashfield was there is a school where we deployed as many devices as we could because they were taking that online assessment. And we had teachers saying, well, you know, we want to use the tablet carts at the same times. We don't have enough devices. So when we were walking out of the Ashfield, I said, well, here's the dilemma. We'd love to give more devices to the Ashfield, but we have schools that don't have any. And so um, I definitely felt that they were uh, appreciating our situation. And I know that we have a couple of meetings coming up. I think you're meeting with the urban superintendents on Friday. It is a topic of conversation. Um, and it's definitely something that they're aware of. What action you know, they take as a result of that, I, I don't know. Um, but they're hearing it everywhere. Yeah, I'm just worried that they're getting, they're looking at part of what they have to do is the, the planning of it, the vision, et cetera, mm -hmm. the bottom line, the uh, logistics. It needs to be done. You have to do it, but we're not magicians. Yeah. And that they have to realize, and that's the piece that I still don't feel is being captured anywhere across the board, in, in particular the legislature, mm -hmm. among others. I'm not even sure they're aware of this part of it. So. Well, well, and, I mean, and they are to a point, but I mean really aware that if this is going to be operational by 19 or whenever mm -hmm. it is, that we don't have the problems where there's not equipment out there. Otherwise, how can you have something work, right. period? And I think although the superintendent was under the weather and we conferenced her in, she very carefully made sure she said this becomes an equity and education issue. Um, yeah, it, it came up for sure. Mm -hmm. As I said, they were, they were very open. Um, you know, I chuckled when they said, be truthful. We were frank. <laughs> we were truthful. Um, there will be talk, I know, Friday at Urban Superintendents. Um, it is going to become an equity in education. And, and when you look at 1993, and it took us a while, and we know the story about the transformation in our schools, Brockton High School, Gold Standard. We know what happened, but that's paper, pencil. That was good practice. This is very different for our students. And we have to make sure. We have to do an assessment of the whole district. What do we need to do in kindergarten when those children come at four and five years old? What do we need to have happen when they're leaving us in 12th grade? Never mind the 10th grade competency determination. How do we graduate them college and career ready? So there's a whole continuum. We're already looking at companies and leases that you've already allowed our technology department. Um, as we bring this forward, we'll continue to have Dan present, but I do want to say, and, and I don't want to jump the gun, but I'm sure you can see it, that it isn't just about a device. It is about digital literacy in the school and the instructional piece there. It's about looking at our IT department. That's going to be a much larger department if we're deploying all of this equipment district-wide. So there's a lot of moving pieces right here that we're seeing, and again, when you talk about 2019, and online testing, 2016 is how many days away? We're three years away from this being the determination for a kid's high school diploma. We have a lot of work ahead of us. Yeah, I, I cannot underscore the point that you're making enough. Um, the state came out with a laughable, and I'm using that word advisedly, laughable estimate of the cost. The cost is not just the devices which in a lot of affluent suburban districts is, is irrelevant. They have as many devices as they could possibly need. The kids just bring them. So there's, you have that issue of their urban districts where the kids have no devices and suburban districts where there's too many devices. But as, as you know, the superintendent points out, 
it's not just the device, it's not just the bandwidth, it's the upkeep and security for all those devices, which is, it doesn't sound like a lot, but we have large schools. You want to have 700 devices that you have to keep tabs on and repair as need be and image and re-image when the, you know, and also how do you teach the teachers? This is really the, the issue. How do you teach the teachers now to teach with this technology? It's not as obvious as that sounds. It is a totally different medium. And so this is a huge undertaking. And the state right now has not said anything that seriously addresses it, but we're hoping that that will come. But I guarantee you, you have a superintendent who is not going to let this one, you know, fade from the sight. It, it's forefront and center. What is That's not a problem, but certainly for the um, communities like ours, that could be a problem. So in school, fine. You go home, you don't have access, then what? Right. Then the other is, which is very important, the parents, the custodians of the kids. Is there anything or any plan or any suggestions for something so that they can help their children or with some understanding? Because if they go home, it's like when we did change the math. You know, so we would be, we've been down the road. We know what happens. The thing is, let's not get caught on that road again. So as you're bringing this up, that's something else that needs to be put on the board and very real. Because we do look for those parents to be part of the education and providing some of that. But if they have no clue, where are we? Right. Yeah, and I'm going to say this again because it just just giving a kid an iPad or a laptop or whatever, it could be state of the art. That's not the same as doing academic work on that. No. Texting your friends is not writing a formal composition. It just isn't. Right. And so it, it's... It's like the opposite. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, just, you know, that I'm thinking what you brought up, and I was like, wow. I didn't even think about all the training you'd, you'd want to do for parents about what are good practices for your kids. It's not just here's a device. Right. And says, so oh, geez, that's another piece of this. But that's our parent community outreach, so. <laughs> that's right. Okay. Liz, did you want to touch on that? I know we've sure. got a number of things. So yeah. just an update quickly on the strategic plan sure. and um, our improvement plan. Okay. Um, the district strategic planning group continues to meet. There's a group that focuses on the three main pillars, instructional excellence, supportive environments, and community engagement. But then there are several subcommittees uh, that actually meet. They're called strategy teams that focus on different areas within each plan. Some of the things that we've done recently is we've actually initiated a process where we're coding our professional development offerings so that it's clear what area of the plan they actually align with. Um, and that's been um, an informative process because it allows us to almost inventory what areas we're hitting and what areas we really need to do a better job in. Um, the other thing that we did recently was we um, revisited the student outcome measures that we had committed to um, early on in the process and said these are going to be uh, the measures that will determine whether or not our plan is successful and that forces us to regardless of what's in the plan to keep kids at the forefront of it um, and plans are being tightened and revised to make sure that those targets which are student outcomes um, continue to be the focus within the plan. The other thing that's happening now is the goal leads for instructional excellence, community engagement, and supportive environments. Um, they are also reviewing individual school improvement plans because if you recall, each individual school has those three main pillars. It's very aligned to the district strategic plan, but it requires us to loop back at the district level and to say all of those school-based initiatives, for example, what you saw um, when Val was illustrating all of the things that they're focusing on at the Brookfield, all of those school-based initiatives, how do they fit in with the district strategic plan and how is the district supporting individual schools in maintaining and achieving some of those um, things that they set forth to do. So those have, those have been the things that we have been working on. Um, recently and I'll continue to bring updates as, as we have them.
Um, let me just add a couple of reminders. Uh, we do have the uh, Charter School New Heights uh, Charter hearings this Thursday from um, 4 to 6 at the Massasoit Conference Center. I'm prepared with my testimony. Um, again, uh, we invite parents or community members or, or people that would like to speak uh, for or against the Charter. That's your opportunity. I know we've done outreach. I've had a lot of comments made from elected officials, parents, uh, people that want to have a say uh, about this particular application. Uh, as I told you before, I've been in touch with the superintendents from both Randolph and Taunton, who also expect to have a presence there on Thursday, a little bit different than last year. Um, note, yep. I, I don't think that we're going to have, the district's going to have as much time this, t this hearing because we have two other districts that are involved. So, as you will recall, you know, it's basically one pro or one nay versus the opposite. Alternate one, 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 one. So, I mean, but it was all us in terms of our position last time. This time it's going to be three. So, um, they're going to sift through who they're going to hear from because of they're not going to extend the time more than four to six. I mean, that's, and that's the shame of it all. You know, the, the first of all, Mr. Jordan pointed out the last time around, and rightly so, you know, you're picking a time where working people and parents aren't around. Four to six. People are just getting home around six, you know, and you strategically make it four to six. A, that's, that's still, you know, to me, you know, poor on their part. Secondly, we're going to have, you know, two other districts, so we're going to be limited. Um, so if there's any school committee members that would like to um, speak, just let me know. Um, and uh, you know, make sure you get in there to sign up uh, beforehand. Um, but I just understand that I think we're going to be limited. Um. Do you have any sense of where Taunton and Randolph stand on this issue? Uh, I spoke with uh, Julie Hackett, the superintendent of Taunton, recently. Uh, they are adamantly against it. They see no need in their community. Uh, they're a community that continues to, again, improve. They've shown great improvement in Taunton. Um, we had some talk about accountability where they had dropped below the lowest 10% uh, along with Randolph, which was strategically why the Commonwealth Charter put them in the original application. It really wouldn't have mattered if you remember back last year, not only were we above the lowest 10% and the way that the uh, law read basically said that the first two Commonwealth Charters needed to go to districts and the lower 10%, there were only two last year. This year, I think there's an abundance of Commonwealth charters out there, so that wouldn't have been a waiver they had to cross. But it was already put in, certainly, with their, uh, their prospectus. As a safeguard. As a safeguard. Um, I've also, again, spoken to Tommy Anderson, the superintendent in Randolph, um, and again, they are against New Heights Charter coming in to this region as we truly feel, and again, my testimony is prepared, uh, there's not a need. I shared with you last time going and hearing the testimony in the State House. I loved hearing about 1993 when Senator Pacheco spoke and talked about what the idea behind Charter was supposed to be. It was supposed to be collaborative about sharing of best practices, looking at some of those autonomies, working with the school district. That is not what happened here. Uh, you read uh, this um, application and it clearly talks about nothing different than we're already doing. I'm very proud of the work in our middle schools and I'll talk at length. At length meaning I have three or four minutes to speak. But I will talk about our middle schools. I'll talk about those students that progress through our schools to high school, you know, that graduate, you know, never mind, you know, defying our demographics, which is so highly thought of in education circles. So we'll continue to talk about that with the Board of Education. If it ain't broke, don't try to fix it. Um, you know, we are not a broken school system. We're a school system that has many, many challenges. And at this time, as I said, there might be a time when a charter school is welcome in a district, you're sharing and working in an area that, that you need the support or you're looking for those autonomies. This is not the time, nor is it the place. Just remember that it's at Massasoit Conference Center. It's not at the public library this time around. So um, be aware of that. And just to quickly go over some good news, I want to mention that we uh, had the new member, uh, new school committee member orientation, our beginning on November 24th. 
all members attend. I see a number of them out there tonight. And I think my takeaway from that, and truly this is important, I think we talked about effective governance relationship between the school committee and the superintendent, which is exactly what we've had with this committee, which really has allowed us to deal with many, many challenges as far as the time that I've been here. Uh, building alliances so that our school committee understands the reasoning behind administrative decisions and recommendations that we make that we continually keep you updated. Uh, certainly the role of the school committee in the decision making process. I'm looking forward to staff introductions to our new school committee members, uh, visiting some of the schools um, and the PACs. I think that's very important. We talked about that relationship that all of you certainly have had with your constituents. We went over meeting protocols. We talked about professional development, uh, MASC, some of our own professional development. And I want to thank Vice Chair Tom Minicello who joined me in, in I think it was a two-hour meeting, two, three-hour meeting. <laughs> we were priming them. It was three hours. It's three <laughs> hours. <laughs> and I and I did very minimal speaking, so I'm going to wonder who was talking the rest of the time. I thought we shared it. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, all right. I also just quickly want to mention the South Shore Conservatory Partnership Award we received uh, in the past couple of weeks. And we actually went to Duxbury to receive the award. Uh, it's a collaboration with our Barrett Russell School, our Gilmore School. Uh, it was wonderful, uh, and this kind of support is truly something that we're very appreciative of, and uh, they were very, very pleased that we went there personally to accept it. Um, we already mentioned the John and Abigail Adams Scholarship Ceremony. We had the National Honor Society last, last week. Uh, it all, always makes me, again, feel good about not being superintendent, but being a teacher in this district and seeing what our students certainly accomplish each and every day. I want to also congratulate uh, John Marion with the Holiday Parade in 2015. It was rainy. It was wet. <laughs> I think, I guess it could have been worse, but we marched in the rain. Uh, at first, I wanted to back out, but when I thought of our band and our boxer buddies there and our high school students, our elementary floats, et cetera, you know, you had to go and you just had to weather it. We're New Englanders. I want to also thank um, Michelle Bolton, who worked, uh, you know, it was hitting the ground running when she came into the district. I know she worked very hard with John Marion to make sure that this all came together. And congratulations to all our students, families, everybody that took part. And I'm very, very proud to call Bill McGauley a friend, uh, who's always been a friend of the Brockton Public Schools. He was the Grand Marshal this year. He should have been in a convertible. Um, he was, was in he a was car. In a and convertible, but the top, top was up. Uh, yeah, top was up. So again, congratulations uh, to all of those people. And that's my report for the evening. Okay, moving on to uh, anything under unfinished business. Subcommittee, can do subcommittee first? Sure. Items to refer to subcommittee. Right. So in looking at your coming down to your final couple of weeks here, what some of the things that we would like to do is, um, I think on December 8th you're doing a superintendent contract subcommittee. And we were hoping that part of that time we could also do a curriculum subcommittee. We would like to look at the policy for talented and gifted so we can finish that up before the new school committee comes on board. And we also would like to do that park presentation with the idea that the embargo would be lifted and we could share with you some of the results in the district. We'll do a lengthier presentation after the first of the year you know, for the community, making sure that that is on camera. But we were hoping to do that in a curriculum subcommittee meeting. And I think that that will clean up all of the things that we pretty much have on our front burners. Can we schedule that for 6 or do people prefer 6.30 to start? <clears throat> okay, great. All right, well, so the first subcommittee meeting will be 6 o'clock, okay? And is that going to be here? Yes. Here, okay. Great. Anything else under subcommittee? that's it under subcommittee. Okay, anyone else under subcommittee? No? Okay. Unfinished business? Anything under unfinished business? No? Okay. New business. Contracts. Some hard work was done. Uh, so, uh, first item under new business is ratification of the MOA between the Brockton School Committee and the International Brotherhood of Police Officers. Um, Mrs. Joyce, you were involved in that. Would you like to um, comment? Or? Well, it was a long process. Um, because we had started the negotiations and then took kind of a um, 
a break from it until the BEA settled. So we restarted um, the negotiations um, when school started back. And uh, it went very well, and I think we came up with a very fair and equitable um, uh, nego uh, contract with our school police, and I think they do a great job for the school department and our students, and uh, I look forward to another three years of um, having a contract in place. Alicia and Ozzy. Great. So it was very important for us to get this contract <coughs> settled because we had been through the process and we didn't think it was fair for a new committee to start again with it. So we worked hard. We worked uh, a lot of late nights on it and it was uh, well worth it. Okay. Um, and I see notated that um, it's basically there's two items, one running from July 1st, 2014, one through June 30th of 2015, and then the um, three-year contract, July 1st, 2015 to 2018. That's correct because uh, law, um, we can by law we cannot have anything longer than a three-year contract. Yep. Okay. So we have the current year, school year, and then we have the next three. Okay. So, um, do you want to make a motion to approve those o both uh, of those MOAs? Make a motion to approve the MOA for the. Let me just get the years right. For I'm sorry, it's last year, July 2014 to June 30th of 2015. Uh, let's take them separately. Okay. Uh, someone going to second that? Second. Okay. Any further discussion? All in favor? Okay. Next item, Mrs. Joyce. Is and uh, make a motion to uh, accept the ratification of the MOA between the Brockton School Committee and the International Brotherhood of Poli Police Officers from July 1st of 2015 through June 30th of 2018. Second. Thank you, Mrs. Uh, Clark. Um, Mrs. Wilson, I'm sorry. I'm going back in time. <laughs> um, uh, any further discussion on the motion? Okay. Seeing that, all in favor? Wonderful. Okay. Um, next item is the superintendent evaluation. I'd like to thank all of the members for providing me with um, their information, their evaluations, the time that they put in, the um, the detail they uh, provided was excellent. Um, so I'm going to take this in sort of two parts. Um, the first part is basically you all were provided within your packets the summative evaluation. Um, and it basically goes through, you know, the professional, the goals. Um, and I'm going to pull out uh, a, a few of the basic comments that were provided. Overall, the superintendent did very well. Um, I would say that um, she scored proficient on the majority of items um, and certainly exemplary on certain items. Um, with respect to professional practice, uh, one of the comments was basically um, the superintendent has done a fine job in building district capacity by communicating free, frequently with their executive team, district leaders, faculty, school committee members, and elected officials. She works diligently to develop and build relationships with multiple organizations. She displays strength and leadership in her ability to communicate issues with stakeholders at all levels. She is inclusive as it relates to the opinions of individuals while making decisions in the best interest of the district, always putting the students first. While there is still work to be done in building a district-wide culture as it applies to principals and professional staff, Superintendent Smith has built a solid foundation for continued progress. Um, which I think all, So that's one of the members' comments, but I think all of us would agree with that. Um, another comment with regard to uh, district improvement. Um, Superintendent Smith strongly advocates for a facilities master plan to address the short and long-term needs of the physical plant of a large district with aging buildings and a growing population. Time and funding are required to bring about such change, neither of which she controls alone. Progress towards this goal has been slowed only by budgetary constraints, not by a lack of effort on her part. Superintendent Smith leverages internal expertise and resources to secure MSBA support and makes the most out of the limited resources available. Uh, again, I, I think is very truthful um, under the circumstances. Another comment um, with respect to district improvement goals. Um, one of Superintendent Smith's greatest strengths is her work on community outreach. 
She has been proactive and open to the public. She has tackled controversy openly, honestly, and quickly, communicating with the public as allowed. Again, a difficult budget has limited greater, greater progress towards this goal, but Superintendent Smith's commitment to the community will ensure for, further progress. Um, and, and I think that's one that we all have talked about as a, as a committee, that um, we want to implore and want to invest in more outreach. But unfortunately, you know, our educational priorities in the classroom in terms of uh, student numbers and, you know, just put obstacles in front of us that we unfortunately have to deal with. And, you know, when you have to make priorities, um, these items that we would like to invest in um, take second seat, you know, um, which is unfortunate. And, and it also goes into, like Mr. Jordan was saying, the technology issues. You know, um, uh, not only do we need, you know, to have funding and or uh, opportunities for kids with regard to more uh, devices, but, you know, you need <laughs> the support, you know, the manpower, woman power to, uh, you know, maintain these devices, uh, to secure these devices, to, <laughs> to teach, uh, to have professional development with the teachers, and to have time for these kids, these students, to be able to utilize these devices. Just throwing these devices in their hands is going to be useless because these kids aren't going to be prepared to have the time to know how to use these devices for, you know, taking tests, doing you know, the question and answer parts of these, uh, you know, park testing, park, uh, you know, MCAS 2.0, whatever they want to call it. But, um, you know, again, um, resources certainly uh, put up some obstacles to some of the things that uh, the superintendent has wanted to, uh, to implement. Um, I think another relevant... Um, I'll wrap it up, but another relevant comment um, in the overall summative performance of the superintendent was, um, <clears throat> given the many challenges she has faced over the course of the year, it's fair to say that the superintendent has done more with less. Through her leadership and the leadership of her team, the Brockton Public Schools has continued to grow and improve. Her work ethic is most notable. Um, she works many hours to make sure Brockton is a district that is respected by parents, students, teachers, and the community. Her actions make clear that the safety, success, and future of all our children within our schools is her paramount concern. Superintendent Smith continuously looks for ways to improve her vision for a greater school district. And, and, and I think that one really summed it up. Um, and the part about uh, her work ethic. Um, I've always kidded around with her and said that if I had to pay you by the hour, I'd go broke because her car is always at Central, you know, late at night, on weekends. Um, so uh, no one can say she certainly doesn't give the city and the students uh, her time. Um, sometimes I think it's a bit excessive, but she needs to uh, balance. But we certainly appreciate... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because you'd never use it. It would be a waste, and so you prove my point. Um, so, um, are there any, uh, anyone would like to make a comment or um, say anything on, on those evaluations and or comments by individual members? Mrs. Joyce. We're pretty consistent in, the, in pretty much in agreement with most of the um, scores that we gave her. There wasn't really any wide variation and fluctuation. So um, that, that does tell you that uh, she is pretty consistent with um, meeting the goals that we have set forth and that she has set forth. Um, I, the the um, evaluation itself is a bit challenging. And, and I think that got in the way a little bit. Um, I, s I had a couple of non-responses, and I'm still trying to figure out how that happened. Um, you know, I, logistically, it was difficult to work with it. So um, hopefully going forward, that will be, a, that will be um, taken care of, and it, it can be a little bit of an easier process. We had this, quote, mandate from the state to utilize this tool. I mean, we had the private company that walked us through um, with fantastic. the program, and they were, they were yeah. excellent. That company was. was superb. Mm -hmm. um, um, but, um, you know, we were basically, our hands were tied. We had to go with the, uh, you know, the, 
the evaluation um, procedures that were set down by the powers that be and um, and we also um, had to fit the scoring within the contract that um, we had entered into with the superintendent some you know two plus years ago mm -hmm. um, and I'll comment on that in a little bit um, Mr. Jordan same thing basically that you're talking about one was I felt that there maybe wasn't enough training for us to um, deal with the, the ability to answer the questions the way we'd want to and I think some of us even though we had an excellent uh, our in-house people helping us out but it's 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 awkward the overall it was awkward. it doesn't flow uh, the way it should to make it easy for us to go ahead and do the kinds of things we want to do the other thing I wanted to add I think we had this past year some unusual situations that came up that were handled that you just have to forget everything you're doing and go right to that and we had two or three of those which I mentioned in, in my comments, <coughs> in my written comments. Um, not all schools experience those kinds of things although it seems like every day on the news we're seeing things but but those are the things that when you can really take on those and, and have the result that we did that was very positive you know that shows the level of what we have at this, this in this district by, by everybody involved um, and it takes everybody at that point there's no question about it so that's something I think that I thought was you know very good as far as we yep. um, I would agree with you and I would agree with Mrs. Joyce that the um, consistency of the um, scoring by all the members shows that um, you know there is uh, overwhelming agreement in terms of the performance of the superintendent and support for uh, the job that she's doing by the school committee um, which uh, is certainly a compliment to her. Um, no, there's there. Th 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 I guess it makes life interesting, <laughs> ups and downs. Um, so um, the next sort of piece to this is that, um, well, for, uh, with respect to the evaluation, uh, agreed that the tool was odd because of the you know state mandate um, and. Again, it's like this park testing. They've got to work the bugs out of that, and they've got to work the bugs out of this, too. Um, but I would like to thank um, Michelle Connors and Carrie Kopp for assisting us with that piece. Um, uh, they did a very good job and would always be very um, attentive when we needed them to help us out. Um, so then the next piece was basically translating this into a, into a score. Um, and into her uh, meshing it into her contract with respect to the um, contractual agreement that we had um, her contract calls for basically uh, a, a four a four um, tiered compensation review zero is unsatisfactory one percent represents needs improvement two percent represents proficiency and three percent equals exemplary and I'd like to thank Aldo Petronio for basically going through this um, taking A and producing B. Um, so when you go through the different um, categories, um, everything, you know, most being proficient, um, there's also the um, rubric that doesn't fit her contract, that basically there are five items um, instead of four blocks of um, um, consideration um, so you know generally you know we de we dealt with when we first had our contract you know unsatisfactory needs improvement proficient exemplary and that was zero percent one percent two percent for proficient three percent for exemplary um, then we have the state rubric which basically calls for in some cases a five-tiered system no progress some progress met pro um, significant progress met progress succeeds so basically um, after consultation and um, determination, uh, the met progress and significant progress seem to fit within the proficient. Um, so, uh, two percent was basically utilized to represent those scores. So, proficient, met progress, and significant progress, which was basically the bulk of all of the results. So, um, 
when you calculate all the different categories, the 2% plus the exemplaries that she really, uh, received um, bring her over 2%, uh, bring the, uh, the average score to 2.25%. So um, basically that would translate into a 2.25% uh, adjustment to her level of current level of compensation. Um, so um, I remember that the superintendent kidded around with me and said, you really negotiated a frugal contract because it was zero to three rather than zero to four or, you know, so, um, um, but I think that again, this shows uh, overwhelming support for the superintendent. Um, and um, we appreciate everything you do for the system. Would you like to comment? Like Absolutely. You know, one of the things we've heard loud and clear uh, is we come to the end of so many of you leaving, five of you leaving out of, of seven. Um, you truly have allowed me in the two and a half years to be able to do my job and to know that support was there, uh, consultation was there, decision making we did together, dealt with a lot of challenges. Um, I read many, many articles and many, many magazines. And one of the things they talk about for success for a superintendent, for a school district, for the student, comes down to the relationship between the school committee and the superintendent, the school board and the superintendent. And I think people need to know that that makes a difference. It really was your hard work. Um, when you talked tonight, we had seven con bargaining units in negotiations. You settled all of them. Um, and, and that allows us now for the next few years to go forward to implement those contracts. Not only were they fair, they were strategic. They allowed us to hire people in areas that we had high needs. Um, we took a look at our Brockton Education Association. There were some changes we needed to make for equity for our teachers from elementary to high school. It has been a lot of hard work, certainly from the school committee. Taking that a step further, when you talk about a superintendent's success or failure, this being hopefully some success, it isn't just about me. It's an executive team that is there all hours. They're there to support the work going on. Um, I know that whatever comes up, there's a group of people that are advisors that help with key decision making, right down to then working with our relationship with the Brockton Education Association on a very regular basis. We have dialogue. Sometimes it's hard dialogue to have, but it's dialogue that allows us to move forward to be able to support our teachers, our, our support staff. So I think this more talks about our district and it talks about the way I think that we want to do business. I know the new school committee members, you know, coming on board, that was really a discussion I had with them, you know, by working together and it's okay to disagree, but uh, in, a, in a way that allows us to make the best decisions that we can make that moves our district forward. So I want to thank everybody um, from the school committee to the team that, that supports any of our efforts. Okay. Um, can I have a motion then to accept the end of cycle summative evaluation report for Superintendent Smith together with the uh, corresponding 2.25 uh, uh, percentage contractual increase? Okay. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Okay. Great. Thank you. Uh, Okay. Um, anyone have any further or new business to report on any other items? No. Um, okay. I do have something that I want to um, just announce to the public. And every year at this time, um, our good friend Dave Gorman does his Jingle Bell Run. And um, this Saturday coming up, over at the Massasoit Conference Center. Uh, registration will be at 12 o'clock. Uh, race start time is 1 o'clock. Um, you can either run or walk. Um, I usually walk. It's a great uh, fundraiser for kids. Um, he does so much. He, I mean, he, the, the Dave Gorman on his own basically raises, you know, between 15 and 20 thousand dollars for kids, and every penny of it goes to um, provide some some needy families, some needy children with something for uh, Christmas. Um, if you like to wear costumes, there's prizes for the costumes. You can win Bruins, Celtics tickets. Um, there's tons of raffles, things that you can um, bid on if you want. It's a free uh, hot uh, lunch buffet. Um, the entry fees are $20 for adults, $10 for children, or if you're uh, a child and you bring a non-perishable food item, 
um, that would be you'd, you'd be free. You'd get there for free. You'd go in for free, and it's a family maximum of forty dollars. So um, I can't say enough about the work that Dave Gorman does. And um, you know, if you want a, just a fun time uh, to hang out, uh, it's it's always a good time. Um, and it's there's always some very festive costumes and uh, some interesting uh, uh, costumes that I could say uh, over the years that have been just uh, floored me. So. Um, that's with respect to the Jingle Bell Run. So, um, any other business? Okay, we do have uh, an item for uh, consideration by the school committee that uh, would call for executive session. Uh, the item is dealing with the extended day report that we've received. Um, so, I would like to uh, go into executive session on that matter. Um, and basically, we are allowed to go into executive session pursuant to MGLL, MGL Chapter 30A, Subsection 21, Number 7, which basically uh, deals with uh, compliance with regard to uh, general or specific laws or federal grants and requirements. So we have sound legal footing to go into executive session uh, to discuss this report, and I would, and we would require. Uh, by law, a um, roll call vote. So, um, I'll take a roll call, um, um, basically a motion to go into executive session. Uh, second. Okay, and now a roll call vote. Mr. Henningsen. Yes. Mrs. Joyce. Yes. Mr. Jordan. Yes. Miss Wilson. Yes. Mrs. Wilson. Yes. Mr. Robinson. Ms. Sullivan. Yes. And I say yes as well. Um, we. Um, will be in executive session for some time. Uh, I do not anticipate any further business of the school committee except to come back and basically adjourn the meeting So, um, because we have to come back in and adjourn this meeting. But um, if you feel like just hanging around and to watch us adjourn a meeting, you're welcome to. But um, uh, other than that, there's really nothing else that we'll be discussing uh, in the open session. So um, we will temporarily go into executive session and uh, have a good night if you uh, choose to go home. Okay. Um, I guess we need to have a motion to re-adjourn briefly. Mr. Jordan? To re-adjourn? Well, a motion to adjourn. Yeah. Make a motion to adjourn from the regular school committee meeting. Okay. All right. So now that we've come out of executive session okay. by roll call vote, right. we will have a motion to motion to adjourn in the regular school committee meeting. Second? I'll second it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor of adjourning? <laughs> okay. Thank you.